Okay, thanks everyone for, for being here. Uh, I'll make sure I don't go backwards this time. So about the SCA, 95% uh, of the slag used in the United States, it comes from these manufacturers. So today, yes, I work for St. Mary's Cement. However, I'm gonna be speaking more from the industry standpoint, right? And, and that aspect. And you'll see a lot of these ones here that are also listed on here are also cement manufacturers or also part of the Portland Cement Association. So a lot of the information I'm gonna be saying today will be information that either came from the Cement Association of Canada, the Portland Cement Association, right? Or the Slag Cement Association are a lot of the information and a lot of stuff I got out of here. Other things that you might see in here is someone called Larry Sutter and Professor Hooten. A lot of their research and a lot of their information is also in a lot of these slides. So with that, I'd like to thank Doug and I'd like to thank uh, Larry for his help and in the information that they've been able to do for us. Slag cement shipments, you'll see that slag cement shipments is about just under 3 million tons to 4 million tons a year. On the Portland cement side, it's about 100 million tons. So the relationship of slag cement to Portland cement is about 3%. So is it the thing that can help out everyone? No, it depends on its localities and where it's at, right? Thankfully, in the Great Lakes, we have a lot of steel industry, right? So we're blessed with having steel. Since that's the blast furnace slags or the blast furnaces, we can have blast furnace granulars. Therefore, we've got an abundance of it here. Where if we go to another area, they may not know slag as much because it's just not prevalent, right? Or it could be fly ash or it could be some other things that they could be using in those aspects. So one of the things we're going to talk about with the slag cement if you want to know more information, they have a lot of case studies. They have the SCA awards. Those are good to be into. Um, if you need to, reach out to Nick, who's over here. He'll be doing the SLAG um, award presentations. He's our director for the SLAG Cement Association. And one good thing about the SLAG awards is there would be a presentation that goes at ACI national meetings. Then there's also in the ACI international, I think it's usually in July or August, they will present all in the in that magazine all the winners from the previous year so in that that means the designer the um, architect the um, ready mix producer and if there's a testing company or something that was involved doing all the details of the mix designs and all that that could also be part of it so everyone would be able to get award on it now the key thing is the nice thing is if you go to the website we keep all those case studies so let's say you're doing one, and a good example is there's this little tiny bridge called the Peace Bridge in Buffalo that there was a company there that was the design firm and they wanted to use fly ash on it. They said, nope, must use fly ash. Well, Buffalo and Ontario are both highly slag markets. There is no fly ash for the, for, for the most part in Ontario. So how are they going to do this update of the bridge without that? Nope, must use fly ash, must use fly ash. Well, I, on the awards here, two months before, that same engineering firm was doing a job down in Florida. Guess what they used? They used slag. So by having the awards, they were able to get comfortable and see that. That job for the Peace Bridge ended up winning an award later on, and they actually changed their specifications to allow the use of slag, and then as they changed it for that certain part that they were doing, the waffle slabs, they ended up changing it that everything ended up having slag into it. So it's a good spot, good area to see it. Doesn't mean that it's all big, high profile jobs. It could also be small profile jobs too, such as combined storm sewer overflow that's in Clyde, Ohio. Probably most people here may not even know where Clyde, Ohio is. I know you do, Bill, but maybe other people don't. But that's what they use. They use slag in that combination because it was wastewater that they needed to treat. And that's what they did on that aspect. So if you go there, you'll find a lot of information on that. There's also videos and webinars that are on there. So this webinar will actually be on, put onto our website there. And then the big thing that's in there is life cycle assessment calculator. And actually our industry EPD is also on there as well too. Um, then there's also info sheets. So kind of like the concrete and practices that you would see for the NRMCA, there's one that's going to be on what is slag? How do you use slag? Uh, sulfate resistance, how do you do sulfate resistance, all those aspects of it. Uh, it could, there's also ones on strength and aspects of those 
that you can then go and look at it. Early strikes, set times, all of that is in that information. And then also posted on there is events like we have a concrete slag school. We originally did the concrete slag school a couple of years ago. It was here in 2022. And that was our first one we did. It was meant for people that were in our industry, meaning our own internal people, to be able to do it. We opened it up and we actually had a lot more engineers and designers being there to actually see it in that. So we're continuing to do that school. Last year it was in, or last spring, it was down in Cape Canaveral. This next one is going to be in Chicago. And with that, here's some of the info sheets. If you go on the website, what it's going to look like so you can pick on them and you'll be able to see all the information you want. These are the case studies. So some of the case studies, like for example, they're big, some of them are big jobs, some of them are not. One of the big jobs that was on here was there was a Trump Tower one for Chicago. There was that small little one that's in the Freedom Tower that's in that small little town called New York City. Um, some of those ones are in there and it'll give you the information on what was used in there, what the mix design kind of idea is, that kind of information so that everyone can understand how to use concrete. Also in there is our environmental product declaration, the industry one, is listed and posted in there as well. Not only is it posted on there, but it's also posted on the ASTM website. So when you're doing EPDs, if it's a public EPD, it's got to be posted through a program operator. And then we also have it publicly posted on our website. So what did we say before? We said there's a lot of concrete, right? If we look at this one slide right here, and you see this first one, you're seeing oil, steel, you see concrete up here, right? This is a logarithmic graph. So if we take concrete, it equals more and dwarfs all the other building materials, right? So if it dwarfs all those other building materials, concrete's the next, is the most used material in the world. There's only one other material, building material used more than that. Do you know what it is? Water, right, the stuff we're drinking. So there's a lot of concrete. Does that mean that there's a lot of CO2? There is a lot of CO2, but that's just because of the sure volume of concrete that we're using, right? So we have ways that we can fix it and, and change that. Where you saw before, when we make cement, not concrete, but when we make cement, that guy, which is coming up to now, was 1824, so it'll be 200 years next year since the initial part of Portland cement was made. So when they make Portland cement, you take your limestone, when you burn the limestone, right, what was limestone? Sequestered CO2. And you release that CO2 into the atmosphere. So that is why the cement numbers may be higher but when we look at it from a concrete standpoint, and one of the reasons for PLC, Portland limestone cement, is if we don't burn it, it's still captured, it's still in the concrete, right? So those are some of the aspects that we're looking at and how things go. When we look at this as concrete friendly, we can see here that if we're down in this bottom corner here, that we have the least embodied energy and the least embodied CO2 in a, in a material. So if we do change from being in concrete and say, okay, let's use timber, for example, are we really going to help out our CO2 thing? No, if we did all of our buildings now out of timber, we're actually now going to make it more impactful, right? Yes, timber does store CO2, but it doesn't create new CO2. It doesn't absorb CO2, right? The tree absorbs the CO2. So once we cut that tree down, there's no absorption of CO2. It stopped. Okay, one of the things that we are starting to see now, and that's why you might be hearing more on EPDs and you're hearing more on stuff and you're also hearing like, for example, ACI created new, right? And that whole thing is to look at the capture and how do we look at things and how do we try and communicate and bring people together on making sure that we can do things that are gonna improve it and lower carbon aspects as well as other aspects too. Because even if we just lower the carbon aspect, are we going to impact other aspects such as acidification, eutrophication, and all those other aspects? So you want to kind of look at everything as a whole, right? Um, this is the FHWA. The FHWA, the uh, GSA were both given, FHWA was given $2 billion, and the GSA was given $2.1 billion. 
in the last um, one of the one in the act, I forget which act it was now that was on it. It was the new infrastructure act, but it's not called infrastructure. Anyways, that was just to deliberately look at how do we count for the projects of this money that they'll be getting, which is trillions of dollars, how do you quantify low carbon materials? So this that you're seeing up here is how the FHWA is looking at it and trying to figure out how to do it. They're still working through how do we put this together? How do we quantify it? How do we measure it, right? So one of the things they're gonna use is they wanna use the cradle to cradle life cycle assessment tools, right? Or the, the benchmarking reports and the industry EPD for the NRMC if we look at it from a ready mix standpoint, right? That's right in there right now. So one plug I am gonna say for the NRMCA, which is a good thing to do, and there are some that are in uh, Michigan that have done it before, which is the industry EPD, is it would be a good thing if you are a ready mix producer to be part of the industry EPD, because if you have the industry EPD, then we can start to benchmark and look at things. Because if we only have certain ones, for example, I'm gonna pick on Prairie on this one. If we have someone like Prairie who does a lot of the high end and higher up stuff, right? They're gonna be probably very technical and know exactly what they need and, and know what they want on it. Where if we all of a sudden have the industry information just beyond the Prairie mixes, that might not be accurate for the rest of what's going on in that same, in, in that same area, right? So we don't want all the designers to go and say, oh, look at this one here I have as 100 pounds, but is that a reality? No, we gotta also look at locations, all those and the different aspects, right? So that's why the industry EPD is very important. When we look at it from the GSA, GSA is the government services agencies, right? So all the buildings, all the, infra all the real estate that the government owns, all the new buildings they're going to do, they're gonna follow this statement here. So they basically came up with an idea that they said, okay, if you're going to make a 3,000 pound mix, then you can't, well, let's change it to say 2,500 pound mix. You have to have 242 for a standard mix. And if it's a high early strength, well, we'll give you a little bit more 314. This may work in some areas, and it may not work in other areas. Like we know with concrete, right, it can change depending on what the project is. So one of the things that's good to do, we'll talk about when we get in the NRFCA one, is it's good to not look at the mix design on its own, when you're looking for low carbon on a project, you look at the whole project as a whole and figure out ways that you can lower it in some aspects and in other areas, you may actually have mixes that have high carbon in them, but there may not be that much volume, right? Good example is if we're making it a, a large building, right? We need columns. Are we better to have big fat columns or are we better to have tall and skinny columns? The owner is probably gonna like the tall and skinny columns because that means he has more real estate in that building versus they being used up by that product. Now example though, we look at the mass foundation. That mass foundation, we could probably have it as low carbon concrete because a lot of times that's where slags and fly ashes and a lower cement content is used because of the heat aspects. So we can use those aspects to help us out. So basically about 2016 the EPDs kind of started on the concrete industry compared to the other industries like meaning steel wood and all that we have over 40,000 EPDs in the United States the other ones are in the hundreds and it keeps on growing and growing because as we make a new if a plant gets an EPDs right and they now have them based on their mix signs, you could just think of how many EPDs could be out there based on every mix design that's used. Like John, you know, do you only have three concrete mixes at your plant? No, you have, you have about a thousand of them, right? You might be batching three, but you could have over, and it could always be a numerous and changes on those aspects. So with that, the industry one started the doing EPDs back in, like I said, 2016, they did product category rules. After the rules, they then did, did start making the EPDs. And the last version, so we're on our second versions. A lot of companies or a lot of industries are only just starting theirs or haven't even started theirs yet. So from a concrete side, we're, we're fairly ahead of everyone on that. That's why you're seeing the GSA or you're seeing FHWA 
now coming to us and saying, okay, how do we do this? And they're starting to show those numbers. We got to communicate, we got to educate them, right? That concrete is not just concrete. 3,000 PSI concrete is not the same as 10,000 PSI concrete, right? Two different things. So one of the things that we did was the Portland Cement Association did their last EPD. The last one they did, they did two of them last time. They did one on Portland cement. They also did another one on Portland limestone cement because now it's starting to get used more. And actually, since this has happened, it's actually even grown even more. For example, in Michigan, most of the cement that's in Michigan is probably going to be a 595 cement and no longer a C-150 cement. So that means that's going to fall underneath the Portland limestone cement one. That's going to show our numbers. Why is the big reason for doing it? One of the big reasons, it's a lower carbon content, right? It's an easy picking that's 10% of the CO2 that's gone. People may not know this or know this, that in the last two years that it has become more in Michigan, Michigan is probably one of the ones that has saved CO2 compared to a lot of other areas where that has not happened yet, right? So when, you, when you're thinking it, people say, yep, look, at I saved 10 pounds of CO2, right? Just using his numbers, if the Cement Association one is 100 million tons a year, and that's 10%, that's 10 million tons of CO2 that did not get released in the atmosphere. Is there a changes? Not much, but like everything, right? You still need to verify, you still need to test, you still need to check it out and make sure you're still getting the same properties that you had before, right? If you go and you buy a car that was from 1912, is that 1922 car gonna be the same as a 1912? No, you're gonna be looking at it and testing it different, right? So from these three here, you got the slag cement one. The slag one, its numbers was 147 the last time. This time, it ended up being 147. When we look at life cycles though, we're looking at the distances traveled, the material extraction, right? And we're also looking at the electrical power and all of those aspects into it as well. So in the last one, we found out that the companies, the cement companies, were actually being more efficient. The electricity grid changed. However, we were getting a bunch of granules coming in because while this was going on, the steel mills couldn't keep up with what was going on at the time. So you see how those changed, but ironically, it ended up being the same number. The difference was it, it actually improved by 0 0.01. <laughs> so it was just weird. But on the Portland Cement Association one, the industry one used to be 1,040. Now it is 942 right, if we were just using Portland cement. With using the Portland limestone cement, the industry average is now 842. So we've now just in the last year, right, have dropped in concrete from the cement side, we've dropped it by over, what, 840, 942, 842. So you dropped it by basically 100 to 200 tons of CO2. So those are big numbers that people don't even probably realize we have it. How can we show it and how can we show that those numbers are there? By doing the EPDs and by using industry stuff to do that. Okay, then from those ones, the NRMCA industry one was made, right? The NRMCA industry one, it's gonna be coming up again October 6th is when they want all the applicants to be bringing their stuff in and then we can start to do the, that analysis. Also with doing that analysis, then if you've done it with them, if you wanted to make your own type three product specific EPD or even just your own, just to see what it is, you've gone through the process, you now know how to do it. And isn't it better to have someone who already knows how to, who's done it, and let's say you send it in, and trust me, we've done tons of them where we've done it and went and said, wait a minute, that plant doesn't make sense compared to the other plant that's right beside it. Did we make an error in the, in the numbers? Oh yeah, we, it doesn't use that much water and you could see that. Or you could go and you can look at this and say, wait a minute, we got a cement plant in Charlevoix, Michigan, that's very similar to the one that we have in, in Quebec that we just acquired. And why is the number so much different compared to the other? What happens if I take that Charlevoix, Michigan plant, now pretend that it's in the same place in Quebec? Oh, wait a minute, the numbers became the same. Why is that? Non-materials. Electricity. electricity. All it is is electricity. I'm saying material-wise, they're doing the same things. They're same logistics kind of way of what, how the, both those two plants work. One's on almost 100% hydroelectric. 
How much CO2 is being released from fossil fuels on that end? Not much. So those come into play and those are factors that can all be into it. That's why the industry ones and in going into regionalism now makes sense on, on aspects of it. So when we look at it, after the NRMCA made theirs, we then took that and made an, an EPD tool. So instead of having to go through their grids and go and say, my mix I'm going to use is kind of like this 2000 PSI with 15% slag, uh, here's the number. You can actually go on to this Excel spreadsheet, type in the information, and it will actually right there pop, populate the information. It will also give you not only the carbon impacts, but also give you the other five main impacts, which is acidification, ozone, and um, what are they again? So smog, eutrophication, acidification, ozone depletion, and climate change. The same five that would also be in, if you're doing lead projects, right, USGBC lead projects, if they ask for that same thing. This calculator in here will actually help you look at how you can optimize and get to that one credit that's in those aspects under version 4 and 4.1, right off the Slag Cement Association website. It's a free free one for everyone to use. And we want people to use it because we want not only the ready mix producers to use it, we want the designers to also use it as well. It's a good communication tool to say, okay, how do we do this? Remember before, a lot of times you see in specifications, a designer might be thinking they're doing the right thing by saying, I want 40% fly ash in this mix. In some cases, you can do that. In other applications, it may not be a good one to do, right? This communication tool allows the designer as well as the ready mix producers to get together and go and say, here's what we can do. Okay, we want this done. And what are you looking for? You're looking for that carbon number at the end, or you're looking for the acidification numbers or those information. So we're speaking the same language now versus trying to say, how are we doing it, right? Some of these cases, and we'll get to this with the NRMCA one, is it, a lot of this will be the help of the designers, the engineers, the ones before the concrete is even being placed and put into together. That communication is key because that communication, if we have that, you're going to see these numbers drop big time because of those aspects. So one of the things that has happened is there's the carbon neutrality roadmap. So in 2050, so companies like um, St. Mary's is part of Voltran team. Right, Voltran team's a global company, small one called like Heidelberg, Wholesome. They're all part of the concrete roadmap, not only in the US, some of them, if they're Canadian, they're also on the Canadian side, but we're also part of the Global Cement and Concrete Association one. We actually have ties that are tied right to the UN agreements on their protocols, right, on lowering carbon and aspects. So these, these numbers are critical. What we've also done too is we've done the, the concrete roadmap, looking at the key five areas and how do we reduce our things. So that pledge is by 2050 is to have concrete as carbon neutral, right? Doesn't mean that there's not carbon in it, it still is, but we're lowering our numbers down. And we have key points that we have to hit. We've got big issues that come up 2030 and that. So we'll kind of go into a little bit of that and try and get all this together in one shot. Okay. so. What was one thing that we never talked about first off before? We talked about concrete and the CO2 being released, right? But do you realize that concrete is the only material that I know of, there might be other ones, right, in mass quantity that absorbs CO2? Right now, that column, which is bare, and that column over here, which is bare, pure concrete sitting there on the surface, what is it doing right now? It's absorbing in CO2. That is key. One of the things that they've done in a bunch of research and they have been able to find out, obviously, if you crush it and you make it into aggregate again, you're exposing that surface. The thing is that clinker, what it wants to do over a long, long time span, not in our lifetime of span, but over its whole lifetime of concrete, it wants to go back to being carbon at CaCO3, right? Which means it's absorbing in that CO2 all the time. The more you can make it as a surface, the more you can do that. So if everyone starts thinking now, you can now realize that, hey, that old concrete that we didn't use anymore, instead of burying it, why don't we crush it up and use it as material, right? Now let's use it as a carbon sink. Is there other ways we can do it as a carbon sink? You can go and look at a bridge structure in that, and you look at the berms that are on it. 
crush up the concrete, put it on those surfaces, let it absorb CO2. Buildings, instead of putting the carpet down on the floor, let's leave, the, let's leave it exposed, right? Outside of buildings, let's leave them exposed. You're gonna see, yes, the cement plant might release the CO2, but the concrete buildings, the concrete roadways, and all the other concrete products, right, can absorb that CO2 back in. And with that, it's about 10% is what we're saying, which is being conservative. There are numbers of up to 50% of the cement will actually be recaptured in again. The research and studies is in out of Norway and out of Finland that have put that together already on it. I believe it's Norway and Finland that have put that information in. That GCCA tool I was talking about has that in there. The new, con the new PCR for aggregate has an appendix in there that now has the demonstrations on how you can do the absorption of CO2 into that aggregate itself. So now if you have it in there, when you go to do your EPD, you can actually use that carbon sink now as an ability to help you out. Right, so in the roadmaps, we're looking at clinker. We're gonna to focus today more on cement, right? PLC, concrete, how we can do it, and the construction looking at, say, less over-designed is kind of the things, but I'm mostly focusing on the concrete side because the SCMs, and I'll talk about the PLC, right? And then we have the recarbonation, which we just kind of talked about, right? So the EPA says that it's 23. Our industry is saying it's 10. We like to be more conservative than, say, a number too high. Um, so when we look at it, one easy thing to look at, if you wanted to just do a quick one on the Portland limestone cement side, another good website to go to is greenercement.com. It's going to tell you spec language on how to specify the new 595s. It explains how the 595s work versus the C-150. It also in there gives you case studies that are in there, um, industry partners, frequently asked questions, all of that information is in there. Like the slide cement association one, the industry PD information is also in there as well too. And if you need to contact an expert, then they'll contact you to someone. And if there is no expert, then they'll call. You can call me if you need to. Uh, in there, the the one tool that they have, which is a real easy, quick tool, is you can enter in your project size. So you can add in a total square feet of the building that may be out of concrete, the pavement and the lane miles, right? The, if you're looking at it from a ready mix producer, you could look at it at the cement silo that you used, right? Or the geotechnical applications. And it's gonna tell you the amount of CO2 savings based on the industry EPDs that we have versus ordinary type one cement versus Portland limestone cement. So if we take a two lane mile road, right? 78 tons, just from that alone. Right, when I told you the number of the 100 million tons and the 10 million, that's how I know what that, that number is. When you look at it and you now start putting into this, you can also on this site, go to the EPA website on it. They have a calculator that can tell you equivalencies and you can figure out how many cell phone charges if you want to know how much that CO2 is in tons. If you want to know what it is on other things, you can do that. The nice thing is a lot of people are doing that now in other industries, right? And they're saying, look, it, we just saved that one tree we were able to plant by doing this. Do you know how many hectares that are going on because of the concrete industry? Didn't say acres, I said hectares of trees and forests that are done because of this aspect. So you guys should be very proud of being in the industry you're in and doing what you guys are doing, so thank you. Here's that top 10 list. So when we look at communicating, right, key thing is, is communicating that carbon, right? The whole industry communicating with each other to figure out how to do that. Good thing is, is also quality control. Because if we make something that may be low carbon and it may have aspects like that, and it only lasts two days, is that really sustainable? And is that really doing anything? No. Or if we're building a building that it may get knocked down in the next windstorm, probably not a good idea, right? We were looking at the longevity. People now are wanting to listen and understand about life cycles, right? We've been doing life cycle industry stuff for years, just people just didn't realize it, maybe, right? If you talk about a building, what do you talk about? You say, okay, why would I want a concrete building? Who wants to answer that? Why would I want an ICF building versus a stick frame? It's a no-brainer. 
Why is it a no-brainer? Well, more durable, less prone to disaster. Exactly. So from a life cycle standpoint, it's going to last longer. If it's going to last longer, that means we're not using that much more energy to recreate that again, right? Or if you had an old brick building, there's a lot of old brick or a lot of old concrete buildings that are still around and still here today. Are they still being used? Absolutely. You can repurpose that, right? So that's some of the things that have to be looked at. Optimizing concrete volume. Like we said before, if it's certain projects, we might want to thin out certain areas to do it or have a more durable one that is maybe thinner and do the same impact on that. So on the designing side, we might look at, say, highways. Do we really need an 18-inch concrete for a driveway? No, we don't need 18 inches watt thick of concrete, right? We probably can get away with four inches. So on parking lots and so forth, do we need 18 inches to be the same as a, as a highway? No. Do we need it to be design it right, right? So optimize the concrete volume. Um, also looking at alternative cements. Some of that's going to start to happen and some of those are going to be coming in to play, right? Especially with the technology we have, the use of computers, and as we're getting more information being able to collect it at our fingertips, we're going to see a lot of those aspects start to change. Uh, one other thing is supplementary materials, right? Slag cement, fly ash. Uh, other ones, ground granulated glass, you're going to now start seeing coming into those. We've got to still test them though, right, to make sure that those ideas work. That's what the fly ash industry had to do. That's what the slag cement industry had to do. You had to test it, try it, make sure, and see if it works, right? The use of admixtures, right, that has helped out tremendously. When we look at using this tool, even though it's on the slag cement association tools, if we reduce the cement contents or we put in the water reducers, we can see how those impacts can change us, right? Lowering the amount of water that's in that concrete may help us on a durability, and by using the admixtures may help us with that. Or finishability, workability, all those aspects, they're available and they can be done. So those can also help us in our toolbox, right? And we also don't want to eliminate or don't eliminate certain ingredients. Like there are still specifications I see today lots of times where they'll say, nope, you cannot use slag cement, or nope, we cannot use 1L. And in that very same one, they said, we want low carbon concrete, but you must use type 3 cement. So how are we supposed to get to there? That's where that communication key thing comes in, right? We want to set targets on the whole project or the whole concrete aspects versus looking at it like a concrete bank of CO2 versus one mix specific, right? And then we may want to look at different times of the year, right? We live in Michigan, or you may, some of you live in Michigan. I live in Ohio. But it's always changing, right? What you do in the summertime for concrete is going to be different than what you do in the wintertime. So you may, it might be a good idea to have, say, this similar type of mix that may have three different supplementary rates of slag depending on the time of the year. The ideal thing you can do for a contractor is to give him something that he thinks is consistent the whole time and sets and does the same thing each time of the year. If we start working and doing those aspects, some of the time it's going to be a lot more advantageous on the low carbon part. Other parts you might not be able to just because of the weather aspects. But let's face it, in Michigan, is there more concrete poured in September or more concrete poured in January? Right? So we want to encourage innovation. One of the things, I'll go through a bunch of this quickly, is um, slag cement, like Portland limestone cement, right? Blended slag cement falls under C595, okay? We also sell slag cement for the most part in North America, that's how it's sold, is it's sold as its own separate product. And when it's sold as its own separate product, it goes under ASTM C989, or M203, Ashto M203, or 302. And then for the blended cement, it is uh, 595 or C240. So how do you go when you say, well, how do I specify it, right? One of the things is it would be, if it was just slag cement and clinker, it would be a 1S. If it is a ternary cement, right, it would be slag cement and whatever other SCM or limestone was added. So now that we're into the realm of adding in Portland limestones, right, what happens when you have a 
blended slag cement with, we'll say 15% lime or 15% slag and 12% limestone. That would now fall under here as a 1T. So that is one of the newer things that are coming in. And believe it or not, that is already here in the state of Michigan. It is also here in Ontario, and it's also here in New York. So in Ontario, it's just going now through the approval as just past the approval process, I believe. On the Michigan side, there are ones that are starting to go and trying to get the MDOT, MDOT certification. We'll be looking at getting it for also for ODOT certification as well. What's the reason for doing this is we're going to see that if we can make that cement be the same as Portland limestone cement and the Portland limestone cement to be similar to the C150 type 1 cement, then we've moved that needle as much as we can on our end and the designers and the contractors can continue to do what they need to do and they can also continue to do their improvements as well, right? So we're working as a group as a whole, but we need everyone else's help too to make sure that these specifications are allowed. So when we look at the specifications, when we used to be under C-150, we used to know it as one, two, three, four, five, right? That's now changed. We're now similar to like the Canadian specifications where we're going, remember we talked about before prescriptive and performance? If I say a type one cement, I want a type one. Most people say, okay, I just need a general use cement. Now instead of saying, I want a type one, I want, what do you want it for? So if you need it for moderate sulfate, right, you'll see it say 1LMS. If you need it for moderate heat, you got a mass concrete that you're worried about. You're worrying about temperatures, you're worrying about it uh, with the effects that can happen from that. You specify it as moderate heat. Or if it's a high sulfate resistance, you're doing wastewater treatment plants, you now specify it as high sulfate resistance. Or low heat of hydration. And then a new one, which actually just came in August of 2021, was a high early with limestone. That one is now on the approved list, four of them. And again, kind of similar to what we were talking about with the ternary blends, right? On the Canadian side, they have now made a high early uh, cement with limestone. And that now is approved in the state of New York. And that is approved in Michigan. And I, be I believe it's approved in Michigan. Not sure 100% on that yet because I haven't seen it on the actual document. So I never like to say anything without seeing it in paper. And then the other one I do know it is, is in Ontario that's now approved. So that now moves that needle down on it. And those are the aspects that have been going on. So one of the key things is we wanna make sure we have quality performance still, right? Quality control and assurances, because we don't wanna use extra or create higher strength mixes to compensate for us making mistakes, right? So we wanna make sure we're testing and accurately looking at stuff. We also wanna keep that communication open and early with all the groups to let them know, here's how this is, and get good feedback. Because in some cases, you might need some feedback on it. In some cases, you might say, okay, yep, we went to, it's a little bit finer of a product. A little bit finer means it has a little bit more of a water demand. If it has a little bit more water demand, it might need some more admixture. Hey, I'm talking to you, Bill, right? So it might need more admixture. Does it make more sense to do it as the admixture? Or does it make more sense to do it on the cement end? That's why you got to look at it as a whole thing. And on the cement side and all of that, if we have cap and trade agreements or you have carbon taxes that go on, right? Those now are coming into play and those aspects now change how you look at things. So when we look at concrete performance, when we're looking at PLC with slag, we can see that without the SCMs, with the slag or with the fly ash, we're not seeing a change on what the information is. This is from Professor Thomas, um, bless his heart, and Professor Hooten on their research. And we're seeing that in day-to-day -day work as well. And then we look at later age strengths, we're seeing the same thing with the SEMs and, and non-SEMs, PLC is acting the same. So if you think that PLC is gonna help you with your slag or your slag is gonna help you with your PLC on going from that to with what we had before, it's gonna be, if it might help a little bit, but it's gonna be more on the CO2 impacts, those aspects, it's not gonna be dramatically, it changes up those but you still want to test and check your information. 
permeabilities, we can see that the aspects are reacting the same. When we look at it from scaling resistance, same thing. We're seeing that you might see a little bit better workability and a little bit more aspects where the slag may, with the PLC may be better in some of those, but that's research is still going on. So we're not gonna go and say, yes, it is without verifying it and checking it first. When we look at free saw, we're seeing the same thing on here. When we look at heat of hydration, we're seeing the same results. As one thing we are seeing with the PLCs is the initial temperature may go up, but the long-term 28 days, seven days and all that, when we do the isocalorimetries is actually a little bit lower. So in this case, the PLC and the slag will lower those numbers. But like anything, you wanna do the testing and you want it to check it. This is an example of a wind farm. And in this wind farm that went in Ontario, they wanted to know what the CO2 was. They wanted to know what the durability was. They needed to do mass concrete. So in this case, it was a win-win. Makes sense to be able to use slag. In their case, they went to the ACI 318 max, which was 50%. By doing that, they didn't have to add in cooling. They didn't have to add in any other energy aspects, right, to be able to re reduce that down. So you can see those synergies are now helping. And then also from a CO2 standpoint, we're gonna see those synergies because we didn't use the energy, we're letting the concrete do its work. ASR, we're seeing similar results. And this was from the 2010 with Thomas. So here are some results um, that are also showing from Caltrans. Because a lot of the data that was done in 2010 by Professor Hooten and Thomas, right, that's been in, in use and we've been using that in, in North America, especially in the Great Lakes area, because we're so close to the Canadian side and a lot of Canadian ones were already doing the same thing, right? This testing. However, Caltrans wanted to do their own testing. So they reinvented the same wheel that happened before. So these are the same results showing that PLC was able to do what it was doing. And you can see here that if we're using general use cement, which would be type one, or if we're, using, um, if we're using it with the PLC, we're still seeing those same effects. Slag cement, as we can see here, is going to greatly improve the ASR abilities on it so that we're mitigating for ASR. So in these aspects, that's where we want to use those SEMs like slag to help improve that concrete, right? That's going to make it more durable, last longer. With the same bare content in all of them? Yes, this is all just one, all this, this testing here that you're seeing here was the 1293 testing that they were doing. And then the C1012 testing, which now we're looking at this, is all sulfate resistant. So these are mortar bar testing. So 1293 is a concrete prism. The 1260s, which is another ASR test, those are mortar bar prisms. So when we look at it for sulfate resistance before, We'd say, I want to type one or a type through. The best thing to now ask for instead of saying, I want to type two cement, ask for what you want in a concrete, right? Say you want a moderate set. You want moderate heat. I'm doing mass concrete. If you say mass concrete to John, John's going to say, okay, I know what I need to do. I need to lower that heat. But if you say, I need a type two, he's going to be going, like I always ask when someone asks me, is this a mass project? Is this thick concrete? Or are you doing a wastewater treatment plant? Oh, well, I'm doing a wastewater treatment plant. Those are two different total concretes, right? So that's why it's good to ask that question. That's why I'm glad with the way it has gone to the new nomenclature, we're gonna be able to communicate a little bit better. Well, we look at ternary blends, right? So this is that, C, this is that local ternary blend that is locally here right? This is a test result showing it with um, just it on its own at 15% and then adding in 12% slag to make it like as if it was 15% or 25% in the field. So this was done to be deliberately done at 15% and the reason why is to help lower our global warming potential aspects, right? When we make slag cement, we actually have to use a dryer to dry out the granules to then, um, to then do it. Drying it, obviously, is going to raise that impacts of it, right? 
So if we don't dry it, but we can put it into the mill, the same as we're putting in the clinker at the same time, and we can do it at 15% and not have to use the dryer, we've now done that same thing. When we look at it from another way, if we're looking at it from a thing, and we know we're doing it at 15, we know at 15 we can use that all year long, right? So that means that we're getting a more durable or a more sustainable one all year long on that aspect of it. So those are the ways to look at it from that. Ones that only have a single silo ability, they now have this as an option. This now gives you that what you used to have before as a type 2 cement for sulfate, you now have it in this blended aspect. And if you need more, add more to do whatever the aspects are, then you can add it on. When we've done that testing, and this is our own in-house testing on this, we can see that the results are showing similar results. So the first four that you're seeing here is done at a 505 water, or 505 pound mix at a 5.6 water cement ratio, non-air and train mixes, these are done in the lab. And then when we did a high strength one to see is there an aspect difference, we're doing it with lower strength concrete versus higher strength concrete. And we can see we're getting similar results onto it. So whether it is interground by the cement company or whether it is done by the ready mix producer, we can see that we're getting similar results. So when that's still work going on, it's still being done. Your water cement ratio seems to be on a higher end. Is, is that this, was, this is done in our testing. This is done deliberately. The lower cement content mixes we have in our testing, what we're trying to do from on our end, is we want to see the most change as possible, right? So we're trying to dramatically make those changes in our mix design so that we can see is there any variability happening in, in our system. That's the reason for that 505. The 611, if we do a higher cement content mixes, we're not going to have as much difference in variability is what we found. Okay, when we look at it from a global warming aspect, right, taking that same cement, the only difference we did was we now added in the 15% slag without it being on the dryer, right? We have went from 805 to 669, right? So you can see we're moving that needle down again, right, when it comes to the global warming aspect. Now this results was actually came out of the GCCA tool. So we put in our, our one of our plants, put that information in, and plugged in the data that we have, which is the same information that we use from doing the industry EPD stuff. So as we're doing this, you can see we're looking at that now as comparison. This is a better way of looking at using EPDs than it is currently what we're having right now. A lot of designers saying, I want an EPD. Well, is it better just to have a piece of paper that says, here you go, what we did five years ago? Or is it better to use the information, look at the data that we have, and continuously try to see where we're at and try to improve it. That's why the industry stuff is very, very important because if we put it in as a whole data and on all of that as the industry one, just like doing concrete cylinders and concrete testing, is it better to test one cylinder or is it better to test three four by eights? Probably better to test three four by eights than it is to test one, right? And we look at statistics. Is it better to have it as one test result or do we want 30? right? That same thing. You're going to get that better, better confidence on it. So one of the things we're going to look at now, we're going to go in through that tool, is we're going to do a simulation using that, that GCCA or the LCA tool that we have from the Slag Cement Association. We're going to assume that on this job, it's going to be a GSA project, okay? They're going to be wanting to use that numbers that we saw before, right? So in this case, we're going to use a 4,000 PSI mass concrete mix, and we're going to do a 5,000 PSI, or sorry, 3,000 mass concrete, a 5,000 PSI for walls. So this is what we're going to assume is going to be a building. And let's assume it's going to be the Hudson building, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to take it and do it with two things, and we're going to see, can we get to the numbers that we need to do it on, okay? Also on this job, they just happen to be doing it as a USGBC lead one. So in this case, if they had it and they have the EPDs, they had the industry one, you had the product specific ones, even with just the industry ones alone, you're going to see that they would end up having three, cred, three, not credits, but they would have three products that could go towards those credits. So you'd have the NRMCA, the Slag Cement Association one, and the Portland Cement Association one. And if that ready mix producer had a product specific, then that would be four. That's one mix, 
right? If we're doing two mixes now on this job, we now have eight that can be used for USGBC under the lead documents. So like I said before, when we go on the slicement.org site, you can download this tool and be able to use this tool from there. And it's only going to be an Excel spreadsheet, so it's not like you have to go onto that website and stay on that website and do the software from there. You can download the actual file and have the file on yours. That way you can then also need to, if you need to print it or take information from it and want to put it into an Excel, other type of Excel spreadsheets, then you can take that information and do that as well off of that. So one of the tabs that we're going to see on this, you're going to see the introduction. You're going to see the slide substitution. You're going to see the custom mixes, comparison to benchmarks, and then impacts if we want to look at it as a whole aspect of the whole project or the whole building. When we look at the slag substitution one, we've got a, a bar here that we can change the amount of slag. So we can take whatever mix we're using currently, and we can say, we're using that bar scale. How much can I lower these numbers? And you'll see it'll automatically change those numbers that you see on the one side where we're seeing the bars you'll see those numbers go up or down depending on the amount of slag that is used in there. That's just for using it on the slag cement side. Now, if we want to, we can go to the slag substitution, which we kind of talked about, and you're going to see those numbers. Here you're seeing PLC or mass concrete, and then we're seeing the same with slag. So when we look at it with the slag on this, we can see that the um, CO2 numbers did go down just from that, even though on this one we would have used the same uh, cement content, and then this 20% mix we're seeing here would have been the information that would have been on that chart that would be in the in NRMCA industry EPD. So that's that information you're seeing on that one side. What we can do also in this tool, which you can do, is you can take your mixes that you're using for that job, or you could be looking at if you're say John over here, he may want to be looking at, okay, I'm, I got different tools in my toolbox. Which ones make sense for me to use on this job? It might be add mixtures. It might be slag cement. It might be fly ash. It might be something different. Or it might be, do we need that amount of strength onto it? Do we have enough test results that show that, hey, you know what? I am comfortable on, instead of putting in 564 or six bag mix, like everyone else likes to do six bag mixes, am I better to do it at 550? Will that meet that still requirement of what that engineer wants, right? And you can look at all those aspects. You can put that in, it will tell you, you can put it in, is it coarse aggregate? Is it crushed? Is it natural? All those aspects you can put in there. You can put in the accelerating admixtures, high range water reducers, the amount of water that's also in there. All of that calculation is now in that background so that they can calculate what that information is. Once you put that in, in this case, we're going to do that same mix we were talking about. We're going to do one with the ordinary Portland cement. So this would be like, say, the Hudson building if they use type 1 cement. This would be a mass concrete if they used Portland limestone cement. And if they went and they added slag into it, there's that combination. Then on the next one, we just did a floor which is a floor with PLC and a floor with slag added into it, okay? When we look at these numbers, remember, on this job, we knew it was a GSA one. So we're going to follow what the new requirements that they're looking at doing. And we know that, hey, if we're doing a 3,000 PSI, I got to get that concrete number below 306. And I got to get my floor slab below 385. Am I going to be able to do that with my local mixes that I have? Right? In our area, we're going to find out that guess what? We're kind of blessed with our area of what we have and products that we have. When we look at that 306 number, our ordinary type 1 cement, because of the efficiencies and how we do concrete in the Great Lakes, is a lot lower than 306. Right? But if I want to help and still improve the numbers, I can do that with that PLC. And if I want to improve the numbers even more, I can do that with the slag. And in this case, on the mass side, am I better to do it with using the slag and lowering the numbers that I need for the concrete testing that I need done versus adding in ice or adding in generation to cool it down or adding in nitro to do the same thing? 
I may not need all that inf all that extra stuff, right? I might be able to do it with just the inf with just the mixed materials we have. Now we can look at it on the floor end, and we can see here that here are the numbers on the floor end. We can see that if we're at 395, or so yeah, it's 395 on this one. 395. Um, I'm not going to make it with the ordinary original type one cement. I'm going to need to make a change or I need to do something to do that. Now, if I use it with the Portland cement with PLC now, I made it, right? So if we're doing this and we're in the state of Michigan and we already now have PLC and we're already used to using it, we now see that we've got those numbers, right? We look at it with slag, we can help roll those numbers down. There may be other reasons why you want to use a slag, like we said before. It may be ASR, it may be sulfate resistance, it may be durability, it may be permeability or resistivity. All those are good benefits that's going to help that also as well. Now, the two numbers I have up here, when we looked at that FHWA, just to use it as an example, is I'm looking at that slag one and it's at 71% compared to the industry average. So if it's at 71%, that means if they're doing it by percentiles, that slag mix would be the only one we would technically be able to use. If they actually go with the, they haven't said they're doing it yet, it's only just on paper and they're trying to see what the industry thinks and what other people think, but they want to go with 20th percentile, meaning they want to accept concrete on their federal projects that it meets the 20th percentile of the industry average. And if they can't get that, then they'll go with the ones that are in the 40th percentile of the industry average. So that tells you where it's coming from and how it's coming down the pike, right? So now when we look at the benchmarking, right, we can go back again still, look at the adjustments and look at that benchmarking tab and then see on the benchmarking tab, and going back to the slag substitution one, we could say, okay, you know what? In our case, we already knew it, Matt, but if we're, say, in California, they may not have those same options we have. Or in an area that is high fossil fuel for energy, right, is most of theirs, we may not be able to do that. That's why on this calculator, you see at the top end here where it shows Great Lakes Midwest, we put that in to figure out what the energy grid and all of our grid and, and how our aspects are for our local aspects of materials, right? Because if we're in the Great Lakes, what do we have here? A lot of our material is brought in by boat or moved around by boat. It's a lot more efficient to move material around in a 10,000 ton boat than it is in a 24 ton truck, right? Those are the aspects that all connected together change the numbers. Uh, when we look at it from the building as a whole building aspect, we can type in here the amount of yardage of concrete that's going to go in, and we can see what the impacts are from a whole building or whole project aspect. And then those numbers are printed out down here. We can look at that same thing from this building. So this is whether with a Portland cement, ordinary. Here's the numbers with the, uh, with the floor one, and we can see the changes in the aspects of the amounts. When we look at it using it with the floor OPC versus that one, we can see what our numbers are and changes. When we look at it from a prescriptive mix, remember before I was talking about performance and prescriptive? If, it's, if someone says it's prescriptive, you're kind of stuck with what you can do, right? So if it would have been prescriptive in this case to say it had to be type 1 cement versus it being Portland type 1L, we're going to show you those same numbers. And in this case, we're going to see that that mass concrete had 825, that floor had 1829. We, if we use it with the slag, we're going to see our numbers come down, and we're going to see our numbers come down on, on, this, on this end over here with using that slag versus using that 1230. So all those numbers are going to impact our, our changes, right? So if we make a prescriptive, there's nothing we can do and if it's made prescriptive from the designing side, then the design made the, dis the choice, right? If it was made prescriptive from the ready mix end and the ready mix guy said, I'm only gonna give you a six bag mix, 
then it was now made prescriptive from on that end. That's why we need to communicate. We can do this. We just need to communicate with each other to get the comfortability to work right. And in that case, you would see you had a 33% savings on that total project. In summary, right, when we use slag cement, depending on the replacement levels, we may need certain replacement levels for performance or for the actual concrete aspects that we're looking for can be on that. We're going to see long-term compressive and flexural strength improvements. We're going to see lower permeability, and we're going to see high resistance to aggressive chemicals. On the environmental aspects, we're going to see that because slag is a recycled material, like other materials like fly ash, we're going to see when it comes to the LCA and life cycle assessment, you're looking at the burdens from it after it's manufactured. So we're not actually reusing existing natural materials, right? We're actually taking something that would have been a waste and now using it for beneficial use. Now that we've now using it for beneficial use, instead of just stockpiling, putting in the landfill, we're now being able to use it in something that is good. That's one nice thing about the concrete industry is we are able to take aspects and think and change things every day. I like to say that concrete is kind of living, even though, yes, I know it's not actually got blood and not going through its veins, but it really is kind of a chemically living thing. It's always grain strength, it's always improving, and it's always that. That's probably why it's the most used material, building material in the world. So with that, I have that as the end. And basically, to get to net zero from the concrete industry, we need your help. So with that, I'd like to say thank you and looking forward to talking with you more on this. And if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to Nick at the Slag Cement Association. Right? If he doesn't know the answers on the slide again, he's going to reach out to other people and make sure that you guys get the answers that you need and that you want. Right? Because like I said before, a lot of the ones that are in the Slag Cement Association are also in the Portland Cement Association, right? Or are also part of ACI and a lot of a lot of people in the industry that can help each other out. So uh, with that, we want to continue to keep the concrete down on the bottom square here. And it's time for us to no longer be quiet and say, hey, we're not that we're we're the monsters in the room with CO2 because we're not. Right? So thank you. That's it.